Thank you. Sorry about sure. that. <laughs> All right, so I'll, I'll pass over to you, Doug. Oh, okay, <laughs> sure, one second. Um, thanks, thanks for that introduction, Danielle. Thanks very much and welcome everyone. <clears throat> Good to see some uh, happy, smiley faces. And um, okay, so I'm pretty much passionate about energy, basically. That's the short version. Um, yep. That's just evolved from my life being a greenie in Tasmania and uh, realizing we've got to change <coughs> change what we're doing with energy, of course, burning less coal. So of one thing led to another, and I'm now involved. When I say involved, I'll clarify, I'm not paid, but I'm a passionate advocate for community energy farms. And we're building one in Orange starting this year, Orange New South Wales. We're building others in Horsham, Victoria, and down the peninsula. Uh, Morning Peninsula. Um, so watch this space on all of those. Anyway, I've distracted myself already. Um, thanks to Danielle. Thanks to Green Bank Climate Action Group for being here and supporting this and indirectly through your council who are funding this and Green Bank Council have apparently declared a climate emergency, which is well done for them. <coughs> um, my format will be two short videos, only about two minutes each, and it's a short, slit, a short set of eight or 10 slides. And we're thinking um, a quick Q&A after I've done that, as well as a longer session for questions at the end of the show, basically, after me and Marcus have both spoken. Um, that's a summary of what I'm planning. So I'll get on with it. Um, a quick show of hands, who's currently got solar panels on their roof, if they have a roof? Okay, thank you. Um, so that's why we're talking about it, because this option of community energy farms is the panels aren't on your roof, they're in a farm. A bit like a wind farm or community owned wind farm like the Hepburn example. Um, I will, and also cooperatives. Who can name me, um, no, you're on mute. T two examples of big cops, which you might not know are cops. I must admit I have not done my fact check, but I believe that RACV is actually a co-op technically and so is Australian Unity, Australian Unity Insurance for Health Insurance. They're technically cooperative, so any benefits go back to members. I'm actually members of both of them. Um, and the more I think about it, the more I like the idea of co-ops and power back to the people sort of stuff. Um, so I don't ramble. Okay, I will start my video. This is a two minute video from AEMO, which is the Australian Energy Marketing uh, Office. Um, they're basic government business, you might say. They look after all the energy Australia wide, especially the East Coast. The West is different, of course, it's so far away. Um, so it's a video from them, but they got it off the ABC, so there you go. Um, this should work when I share screen, um, and it's just two minutes for an introduction about what the network is to give people a bit of context and background. So let's try this, thank you. Um, this one. <clears throat> sharing that now. Can you see that? Can you see that? Yes? Yes. yes. Thank you. This is us burning electricity on a typical summer's day. Flares mark substations sending power to homes and businesses. Eastern Australia is hooked to the national grid. It stretches 5,000 kilometres from Port Douglas in the north to Port Lincoln in the south, the largest grid on the planet. 200 power stations pump out 25 billion watts of electricity every day. One point two million souls in Adelaide. Three and a half times that number in Melbourne and our largest city, Sydney, all connected to the national grid. Despite its name, the grid is anything but national. Scattered across the Northern Territory, remote communities are completely off-grid, relying instead on diesel generators. Then there's Darwin, Catherine, Tennant Creek and the Alice, the bright sparks of the Territory, each powered by a gas pipeline. The West too runs mainly on gas-fired electricity. 
the southwest corner has its own grid. Two enormous pipelines deliver gas from the northwest shelf, feeding the state. This is also an image of our national electricity bill of $10 billion a year. From coast to coast, we have the ability to power anything just about anywhere. Okay. That worked all right. It's pretty interesting stuff, yeah? Just context and background of what the network is and how um, how powerful it is. The biggest in the world, it said. You know, from Cairns down to Hobart, it's all one link with the bash link. It's all connected. To me, that means, in theory, people learn things different ways. In theory, if I turn my kettle here, the power might come from the snowy or wind farm in South Australia. Hypothetically, of course, not likely, but in theory. Um, so that was that. Um, I'll start through my slides and after slide three or four, I'll show you another short video more about the community solar stuff. Okay so far? Yep. So I'll share screen again uh, and show you this. Uh, sorry. A bit new at this. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, okay. All right, can you see that energy democracy cooperatives on the screen? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, yes. great guys. I'll just skim through these quickly, or not quickly, but <clears throat> won't cover things that uh, will be in the video as well. So this was made um, the last few weeks with this presentation today. Uh, so Energy Democracy is an overarching group company, to be honest, but they are going to manage their cooperatives in different states. When I say manage, I mean keep them on track, do all the admin stuff. Um, the objective is, like it says, sustainable model, the community can benefit during the transition in the electricity sector. Transition is the key word. We're transitioning away from coal, away from fossil fuels, into renewables. And the community benefits because of local employment and money going back to the shareholders. Um, so Bringbank gets a mention here. On the left-hand side of the screen, 20% uh, have solar PV at the moment. 16% 16 percent, 16 half in Brimbank and a bit less in Maribyrnong. I would say part of that reason might be, at a quick guess, the, the different demographics but also different housing structure. Maribyrnong being a bit more dense rather than um, the further out from Brimbank. Um, and we use the term disenfranchised, meaning the unable to install solar, either they haven't got a roof or they might be renting and not, not appropriate for solar panels. Of course, you can discuss with the landlord and uh, have that negotiation, but this is an option where there's no infrastructure on the house, it's on the solar farm out of town. Um, and a graphic there from <coughs> Uh, arena, clean energy regulator, numbers of panels in each state. South Australia's got a very high percentage. Uh, a bit about what's happening around the world. Um, different countries, Scotland and onshore wind. And I've heard lately, recently, they are building now a, um, like the best link between Victoria and Tasmania. One has been built between Scotland and Denmark to share their energy with Denmark having high uh, amount of wind farms, including offshore wind farms. Uh, the bit that surprised me on this with the USA, I did not know they had 26 states, so that's more than half, uh, with developed community-owned solar parks in the states. So uh, the USA has <coughs> certainly some issues, but they're doing something with that, <coughs> which is great. Um, why a cooperative? So this is the nitty gritty about why a cooperative is a good model. I think it's a good model. Shared ownership. I think I said before, but the shareholders actually have ownership in the infrastructure. That means the panels and the battery are what happens. That means there's an upfront cost. I expect questions about that. There's an upfront cost, but you get a benefit, A, from cheaper power, B, the big battery, you can get um, cheap power still when, it's, when the sun goes down. 
The other benefit is that when the battery can sell energy back to the grid, with spot pricing going up and down every half hour or five minutes, um, the cooperative members have a benefit in that. Now, I thought, I thought with the co-op, I'm slightly ahead of myself, but that's all right. I thought with a co-op, that would be with an AGM, and they would decide that each AGM and, and we'd share that benefit once a year. I've only found out the last week or two that would be monthly because it's a monthly rollover of the bills, basically. Each month, the each member would get a pro rata uh, will pay out from the energy that's sold. I can talk more about that later with the... Um, uh, you may or may not know the NEMWATCH, NEM, National Energy Market NEMWATCH, which I might show you when there's question time. Live data about the energy around the grid, like that picture of the Australia, um, what the grid's actually doing every half hour. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, energy resilient community, uh, three and a half jobs, just admin and people cleaning panels and admin for the actual park itself. The copies of the corporate cooperate. <laughs> working together through local, regional and national structures. Um, this is a map or photo of what the actual park in Orange will look like. That's the main road here northwest out of Orange, just about 10 or 12 k's out of Orange. They've chosen, they've chosen with this park, um, you've probably seen plenty of photos of solar parks before. This one will be slightly different. They've gone for the model of uh, tracking, tracking the sun across the sky. So it's more efficient because it's, um, yeah, it's more efficient that way. Extra investment, but also extra efficiency gain. So um, with this park, the battery will be on site. 25-year um, project, meaning that's the lifetime expected. Now, the 3.5 million grant funding with this solar park, even though the model we had was fully cooperative and members owning all of it, with this park, the state government, the New South Wales state government, has put in $3.5 million to give it a kick start, which is pretty exciting because that kind of pays for the battery, I'm told. Um, that helps fund the whole thing. Um, I'm going to, how many, oh, 12 minutes already. So, members' benefits, kind of cover on these, some of this before, but uh, you can still have farming underneath the panels. There's a new word, um, solar agriculture or something. Solar agriculture, it's called. Right. Um, these are some of the benefits for the members, meaning the residents of Orange who go for this. Um, it's called a share parcel for the 2.5 kilowatts. Cheap electricity up front, participation in your community. Additional benefits include things like um, energy efficiency on your house. Once you've signed up, we want to encourage people to have more efficient houses with electricity, but in general, for two reasons, it reduces your bill and what you don't use, we can sell. Many of the cooperative in general would benefit. Orange, you know, it can be pretty cold out there in winter, so there'll be um, some challenges with that. Uh, definition of success for this park or any park is cheap, locally owned. I won't read it out. <laughs> That's some of the benefits. Um, and quick quiz, there's a type over the top row. Um, the role for the community and these are the benefits. I would like to show you as well. Okay. Uh, feel free to write that number down, but we'll be sharing it later as well. That will go to Alan. Uh, I'd like to show as well my other video, which is more about the park. And I'm getting that up now. And then that's another two minutes, and I'll be almost finished. Ready for questions. So that's the slides. Thanks very much. Uh, showing my video, which is... One moment, please. Right with me. Go on. Okay, take that one. Um, bye -bye.
Oops. Okay, I'll stop sharing that one. What's it? Okay. Feel free to put a question on the chat or have a question on standby while I'm just doing this. Um, You don't want my Facebook, do you? Um, sorry, I'll, I might get back to that. I'll look it up. I was going to show you another video about how the how the actual um, solar farm works with the video, but I might get back to that after Marx's talk, possibly. We have to dig it out. Uh, yeah. That's basically you know, should I me. Uh, Again, sorry, Marcus. Would you like me to take over from for, for now? Uh, in maybe then, just after maybe one or two questions from the group or floor or anyone? <laughs> Is that anyone, a question? Does anyone have any questions at this stage? Yeah, Elisa and Ollie both waved. Yeah. No, not at the stage. Yeah. My wife is just waving at Julian. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Doug, I just wondered about the land. Who, who's, um, whose land is it? Sure. In sure. the orange one, for example. And what sort of land would you see would, you know, if you were to find something happening closer to where we are in Melbourne? Sure. Whose Thanks. land would it be? Yeah, good question. Well, basically, uh, this is a farm that's not, how do we word it? Um, it's not, it's a farmland. It's already cleared. Uh, it's not ideal farmland. So it's not like, highly productive at the moment uh so we're going to lease it from the landowner okay. basically we lease it for 25 years i think um we're looking for similar land around melbourne which of course won't be central melbourne but melbourne fringes uh we're after that sort of thing if you know of anyone i'm seriously we're after that sort of potential uh but um horsham i mentioned will be just north of horsham a similar thing farmland it's pretty flat out there uh, the orange one is a bit a bit of a wave in it. Basically, it's about 11 or 12 hectares. Um, and basically, we negotiate with the landholder. I'm pretty sure I've heard that on wind farms, uh, the farmer gets $10,000 per, per tower, per annum. So that's not a bad investment. Is that what you meant, Lisa? Yeah, Anything yeah. That? That's, that's the, mostly, it's, it's private land. Yeah, private land. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we wouldn't want to put this in any nature reserve or anything. We wouldn't put a, We wouldn't would not want to put it on any prime farming land because that's needed for food production. So it's basically degraded land is ideal. Um, facing north is good. N near the grid is a bonus. If it's near the grid, it's just a bonus with less infrastructure to build more towers to connect it. Thanks for the question. Someone, yeah, uh, Damien. Oh. Um, yeah, thanks, Doug. Uh, I, maybe this is a um, discussion later, but I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts about overcoming um, a kind of inertia within local planning authorities, particularly local councils, towards these sorts of ideas. Um, I, I live in the city of Kingston, and there's, um, there's always pressure here on the green wedge from developers. And it's interesting actually um, discussing proposals like this one with councillors who are... Um, defenders of the green wedge and automatically they have a, a kind of almost visceral reaction to the idea of, of putting solar farms on the green wedge because they would see that as development yeah. um, and then there are others who would be opposed to it because they're interested in having it rezoned as, as residential um, sure. and, and that means that there's often a kind of blockage there so anyway just any thoughts or experiences you've had with that sort of issue sure sure again a great question well done um, yeah I'm lucky I'm not the person doing all that paperwork. <laughs> but um, Alan, who's doing all this stuff, you know, this, is, this has been several years in the making, like literally, um, red tape with the cooperative needs to go through um, 
the copy needs to go through fair trading in each state because that's a state-based thing. Councils, we, like we nearly had one in Altona like three or four years back. We nearly had one in Altona North, industrial land that was, um, we were about to sign off on it and then apparently it was on the boundary of Coral Rope Creek, which of course we like creeks, but it had some overlay on it, which we, which we weren't told about through the planning process, which is disappointing. So that kind of thing is, you know, um, what we're going through. Yeah, I can hear you. Kingston, um, Morning Peninsula one might be in Dramana area, loosely. I'm not quite sure, but uh, down your way. Um, that's all part of the process with council, like Hobson's Bay, where I am, I'm in Newport, Hobson's Bay Council are fairly, you know, green thinking, but we haven't, we haven't jumped that loop yet about finding the right land that's available, basically. Um, keep, keep on your uh, councillors, and if you have council elections as well in a few months, I think most, most council elections, I think, are at the end of this year, I believe. Uh, we'll get back to the question, David, later, if you like, and or feel free to get back to me later. I can see a question. Minimum viable amount of land. Yeah, I saw the question. Thanks. Um, minimum amount of land. Okay, so so the model for engine moxie is basically being a hectare, which creates one megawatt. The orange one is actually bigger because of the federal funding and also other investors. It's actually five. We work on one one hectare, which is basically 100 metres by 100 metres, being metric. Um, that's just for the panels, a bit more for other bits and pieces like batteries. Holly, a question? Yeah, um, I this this is all really fascinating. Um, I'm just wondering if um, we're intending to discuss um, the possibility of this happening in like urban areas, like community sort of microgrids, um, or if if that's not a focus of today's session, that's totally fine. But yeah. that, that's just something I'm interested in. Yeah, did you say in libraries, did you say? Or Sorry, in urban areas. So oh, I live okay. in Yarraville myself. Sure. Um, so yeah, just, just curious. Sure, sure mate, thank you. We, we do plan, we hope for more of these in the future for sure, basically. Um, Yarraville, I plan to, as soon as the one in Melbourne, I can be a, a member or uh, part of this. So uh, basically, yes, when there's one in Melbourne, um, watch this space so the energy democracy website which i'll put up before we'll put again later you, you can just register you'll get one or two emails a year just to say they're staying in touch and when when something happens you get an email saying we're doing this do you want to join up basically so it definitely urban areas the farms themselves will not be our tony we missed out like i said the fringe you know sunbury or <clears throat> ballarat for instance something like that but once it's plugged into the grid, because electrons go wherever the electrons want to go, it's not really relevant, but it's handy to be in the same area. I might have gone over time, Daniel. Sorry, we might go to Marcus and get back. Sorry, just to stop, um, you, uh, before you stop, Doug, uh, Janelle also had a question in the chat oh, around capacity in the grid. She asked, um, has there been work with grid owners? <coughs> there have been issues with the rural grid being insufficient to bring power into cities. Sure, sure. Sorry, I missed that. Thank you. Uh, yeah, of course, have to work with them. The grid. Uh, Most of people realise climate change is real. Oh, sorry, that's my video starting. Sorry, just a stick. Um, yes, obviously, we work with the grid management <clears throat> to. You've got to sign off contracts and agreements on you know, how much, who, what, when, where, all those things. So, yes, that's definitely part of the process as well. Um, there's there's a whole string of events. You know, I've got a Gantt chart of this happens and then that happens and that happens. It's it's more than ducks in a row. It's it's a whole lake full of ducks. <laughs> um, but yes, working with them, um, there is some talk now. If you into this stuff about you know over capacity for the grid and even something um, over capacity of solar, uh, there's a long way to go. I mean. To be 100% renewable, or even halfway towards that, uh, we can build a lot more and start shutting down power stations, as in coal-powered, coal 
power stations sooner rather than later. That's my sort of objective, you might say. Hope that makes sense and answers the question. But yes, basically we work with the grid managers to um, make sure they know what we're doing. Because this is, you know, not just 10 houses, it's um, the orange one will feed almost 2,000 houses. Uh, yeah, which I think is about 10% of orange for memory, 20 to 20,000 people in orange, 25. Thanks. Doug, can I just jump in with one question I had? In terms of cooperatives, is there sort yep. of a minimum number of people that you found that um, is needed to make it viable? Okay. Is, that a That's another, is there no, a magic number? There's another great, yeah. The magic number is um, as many as possible. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, good question. So the model for a one hectare farm that I mentioned is, is about 800 houses. When I say 800 houses, 800 clients, some of them can be a small business. They don't all have to be houses. They could be a cafe or a small factory, not an not a aluminium smelter. Um, um, around about 800 for a one hectare. But this one is bigger because of some extra funding and some extra investors. So this one's bigger for about 2,000. But, but also the model is if we've got 1,000 people interested, okay, so we'll build one and plan the next one. If those extra 200 people, they say, well, ask your friends and we might build another one the other side of town, for example. Hope that answers that for you. Sure. Oh, and just following up, Doug, um, so with that one hectare for 800 yep. houses, you had mentioned the employment um, linkages of up to 3.5 people. Yep. It rolls. Um, is that for, that's for that larger size of grid, isn't it? Can you tell us sort of in terms of the employment opportunities True. for that smaller one hectare type? No, but great question. Great question. Um, I haven't got that far down the track, but if, for instance, there's one in Horsham, Ballarat and, and Morning Peninsula, the same people might be, well, we want to encourage regional employment, but it might be effective. No, I'm not sure. I'm, not, I'm on, a, on a tangent there. <clears throat> if it's a third of the size, I'll say one person full time. Yeah, but also admin people doing things like accounts and uh, facilitating public relations, a whole lot of other stuff. Yeah, but you know, I think it's about, uh, no, I don't know how many people to actually build it. Certainly construction phase is about six to eight months almost um, for one of these. I think I'm going over time. I don't want to cut Marcus short. But thanks for the question. There won't be any of that, Doug. Pardon me? There won't be any risk of you cutting me short. So, um, I, um, I'd, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Brimbank Action uh, Climate Action Group for um, putting together all, uh, this symposium. Um, uh, the, the question that was posed before by Julia was it about the limits limits that of solar penetration into the grid? Is that the question? Julia? That was, um, I was reading out a question that Janelli put into the chat. Yeah, that's actually a, a, a very pertinent question. And uh, I, I'm, I'm a solar installer and I've been doing it for some time. And um, it's, it's actually becoming a real issue, that, 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 uh, that question about um, being able to connect to the grid. Um, and the, the, the DNSPs, which are the distributors, the people that own the poles and wires, they're making it increasingly difficult for us to connect solar. Um, <clears throat> so no doubt Doug's dealing with that at the moment, but it's probably different at that level where you'd be connecting to a transmission rather than distribution network. But um, these, <coughs> the vested interests that, that own this infrastructure are making it increasingly more and more difficult. So um, that's, that's really runs counter to um, what we're seeing technologically, which is allowing us a lot more flexibility in the way we connect solar to the grid and the models that can be brought to that, brought to bear to facilitate um, 
um, decentralization of the grid um, you've got that that trend but also a countervailing trend of um, vested interests trying to uh, stymie the, that that uh, that trend so it's a very it's a very difficult situation to to try and reconcile but um, just just to get back to my presentation um, a brief pricey on how uh, solar electricity works it's basically we've got power um, being generated um, from the sun and it gets uh, transformed into energy that can be used by an inverter and um, <clears throat> so uh, and those that power ordinarily gets used by the household first and foremost and then anything anything that's left over then goes back to the grid now for the purposes of this presentation I've looked at microgrids um, I haven't done any myself um, but uh, it's something that I'm very interested in I've done quite a bit of work uh, on communities Aboriginal communities but those that type of solar is standalone solar it's not uh, grid connected microgrid uh, technology but um, I've you know, looking at internet uh, leading up presentation um, there are interesting developments that are going on and I think all um, being able to put uh, uh, panels on a, a shared building structure. Was that the question, Molly, that you had? Uh, yeah, my question was mainly around, like, if I can connect my system to uh, a local microgrid if one gets established. Yeah, well, there's definitely the technology is allowing for that to happen now. Um, it's called, uh, uh, the technical term is virtual net metering. Sorry about that. I had a phone call come in. So uh, this technology is all a bit too uh, interconnected, really, isn't it? Um, yes, it's called virtual net metering, where <clears throat> power is uh, solar power panels are put up onto a shared building structure, and people, um, tenants, or um, uh, renters, even can uh, buy into that solar in, uh, power that's being generated. And it's, a, it's, it's really good that low, low income people and tenants that ordinarily would get shut out uh, in, in participating in this type of uh, venture, it's very enabling. So um, there are companies that specialise in that. A loom energy is one one power company apparently that's uh, that's allowing um, people to uh, or community organisations such as uh, the neighbourhood house possibly that's that's got a, a a small small solar system I think it was four or five kilowatts but for that power to be distributed amongst stakeholders for instance that. That might live remote. Well, that would live remotely from that from that installation. So that's very enabling technology, and it's uh, it's it's really starting to take hold and very exciting, actually. I think um, uh, Avida is one company in based in Melbourne that are, that's rolling out this type of infrastructure. Um, so I. I would think that there's, there's really scope for people that are interested in, in lobbying organisations to think about investing in that. And uh, it's not as big as what Doug's uh, promoting, but it's, it's, it's an important, I think it would dovetail with, with, uh, with that type of uh, initiative. Um, yeah, that's 
it's it's I'm sorry I haven't got much more to give, but I I, I mean I could go on about sol the hot solar homes program and and uh, be a lot more comfortable in conveying that type of information, uh, having worked in that space for many years. But uh, um, I thought that that uh, that this talking about microgrids is something that we could we could discuss further if, if there was if there was interest in that and possibly even approaching the sustain uh, the, the Victorian government has a uh, department sustainability department that would that do take tenders for that type of um, that type, those types of initiatives so if people were interested I could certainly do more work background work to facilitate something like that if that was thought worthwhile Daniel yeah I'd be interested in hearing more about how that works yeah so um yeah does does anyone have any questions I mean it's pretty it's pretty uh sketchy what I've outlined but the technology itself is pretty sketchy as well to be frank so um it's evolving all the time is that a question from Hong? Hong's been, I think, um, summarising really well what's been discussed so far. Uh, can you tell us a little, anything about um, solar bulk buy programs? Bulk buy, right. Solar bulk buy? Yeah, well, that's, that's different from microgrids. Um, the bulk buy is basically, with, with anything that we purchase nowadays, there's a, a critical mass, and uh, if you're able to um, put together uh, uh, an order for a, a pallets of panels rather than individual panels, you do you're able to there's a, there's synergies that that accrue in doing it that way. Um, so a, a, bulk, a bulk buy would be, it, it's the panels that are the expensive. Um, the expensive uh, line item in a solar installation, um, and so if you are, if you have, for instance, had a, a group of people that were in, in, interested in buying um, a solar system, you would put together a, a consignment and and save yourself, you know, possibly of hundreds, possibly a, a thousand, you know, a thousand dollars per install if you're able to do it that way I, I I'd have to, again I'd have to do some more research on the, 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 the discounts that would flow from something like that but yeah that's that's how that how that would work Julia. does anyone have any other questions Damon. um as far as a a path to a community achieving net zero emissions, do you see a kind of rooftop based program that you're talking about um, as being any more or less effective in achieving that goal as compared to a large scale array? Um, uh, that's a good question. Um, my, my feeling is that uh, even in miserable Melbourne winter, there's enough power to, 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 to run a, an energy efficient house. Um, so um, what Doug's uh, proposing is really important in providing um, resilience to the grid, um, especially as we become um, uh, more renewed, uh, incorporating more renewable energy. I think that we need to have big solar plants like that to, you know, to give the grid that resilience that industry and our essential services obviously um, rely on. Um, but I think that, but the decentralization of the grid is, uh, is um, and producing power where it's consumed is uh, a really important, um, important um, facet to, to rooftop, rooftop solar and especially when you couple that with uh, with batteries um, I think that uh, there's 
there's no reason why um, 90 or more percent of domestic dwellings can't be self-powering. I really believe that. And I think that uh, that, in, that the houses uh, are becoming more and more energy efficient. And um, yeah, I, I, I'm a great believer that um, we should be, uh, and I suspect that this will happen more. I was referring earlier to the distributors becoming very reluctant about people being able to connect solar and sell solar back to the grid. I think as they do that, people are going to become more, um, more and more conscious about uh, harvesting their own power and storing it and and even going off grid in a, in a metropolitan in a metropolitan context. So, uh, in terms of um, the battery, if you in, if you have your own solar array at home and you install it to a battery, you are still connected to the grid. Is that correct, or you have the choice to connect to the grid or disconnect from the grid? Well, there's two types of there's two types of uh, uh, battery. The solar battery systems. One would be grid connected, so and that's called a hybrid hybrid system. And one is a standalone system where uh, where you act or you it, it, um, it's completely disconnected from the grid. So a lot of remote situations, a lot of Aboriginal communities, for instance, a lot of people out in rural areas, they would they would uh, be off grid. Um, so uh, that's how, you know, that's the, that's the differentiation. But I, as I said, I think that, that, that I, I foresee that a lot of people are going to choose to be completely off grid, even when they have the ability, even when they have the choice of being grid connected. And um, this is, sorry, this is a really nitty gritty question because it's, it, it, we've got solar panels and it quite surprised me that when um, the electricity goes out, our electricity goes out, even though we've got solar panels and we're obviously producing our own energy. So if you have a battery and you're connected to the grid, um, would you still lose power if the system goes down or can you access that power in the battery? Well, uh, the, the, the reason why, the reason why the, it's mandatory for system solar systems to turn off when there's a grid fault is for line work, line linesman's safety. So they want to be sure that if if there is a blackout and they're working to working on the lines, they want to be sure that those lines are completely dead. And that's the reason why, um, by law, these solar the ordinary solar systems have to turn off um, when there's no grid present. Um, and that's the reason why. Now, if you had batteries, well, then you can you, you can um, arrange things so the there's a basically a switch in your side your, inside your circuit board, and it switches over to um, switches over to a stamp having a standby power, which is either solar sourced or stored solar from your batteries. And then when power is reconnected, then, then the switch goes back to, to, to grid. But you 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 can't you can't run the whole house unless you've got a very big battery bank. You can't run the whole house. You only are able to run power to dedicated circuits in the house for that to happen. No. Um, can you, are we allowed to go over time? Is that... I think we can go over time. We've got until two thirty. Um, so, yeah. It's... Thanks. Because I've got I've got my other video ready. If um, if people want to see that, it's it's only another two minutes. It's an animation when I say video. We also want to show you the uh, national grid thing. The national just to show what the grid is doing right now.
um, really briefly, and then I'll go to my video. Is that okay to show people? That's fine. And then, and then we can go to questions after yeah. that. Yeah. Sure. Uh, cool. The grid at the moment, South Australia, look at the left-hand side of the screen. It's windy in South Australia. They're creating quite a lot. And this, this thing updates. Look at the link on the top, AEMO uh, dashboard. But I just want to show you to give you some idea of what it does. I also want to say that Tasmania, I looked at this last night. It's pretty cold in Tassie at the moment. The so price is, let's call it a unit price, 35 to $40. The Tasmanian price was $400 um, 8 o'clock last night. So the price goes up and down a lot. That'll make more sense when you see this. You might want to look again in your own time. Is that okay? I'll share screen again. So I might be all excited here showing you several things. Uh, I'll go back to share screen when I get this worked out. Sorry. <coughs> sort of had it worked out. To move something. Okay. Oh, that's. I'll tell you what, I'll show you the video because that's more important. Sorry, it's just frozen on me at the wrong time. I'm Hang on a second. Oh, sorry, I just got my thing here. Got... Okay. I can't share screen because I can't move something. Silly. Um, while, while you're sorting that, maybe sure. um, if Marcus uh, Huong's asked a question in there about whether um, if Brimbank wanted to pull together for a renewable energy, what would their best option be? Um, uh, talking about solar bulb buy and the rebates on rooftop solar. Oh, there we go. Uh, no, I haven't. Oh. Sorry, did you hear that, Marcus? Yeah. Uh, sorry, it was the Brimbank. So essentially, talking about if if we if the Brimbank or a group of people in the Brimbank community wanted to pull together to really drive some renewable energy in our local area, what would the best options be in terms of co-ops or rooftop solar or bulk buy systems and that kind of thing? In your opinion. Well, my my feeling is that it's. The cooperative is a really, I, I agree with Doug, I think the cooperative uh, structure of doing things in this space is really, um, uh, there's synergies that come from that and I, I think I, I really encourage that, but I, I, I'm just not sure that, that, we're, that we're on the, at the cusp there, but if we wanted to do something sort of this year, I think that we'd pro and people were interested. I think you know, doing a bulk buy would probably be something that we'd be able to um, broker that fairly fairly quickly, um, and you know, get panels on roofs for, and for, for that to be facilitated fairly readily. But um, yeah, so that would be one option. But another option would be to to, to look at. Um, Doing uh, something with uh, Soul Soul Share, I think, is a is another community based organisation that allow people to buy into solar farms, so and and then receive a dividend that they might then use to pay for their retail solar. So there's different ways that people could participate in in um, facilitating uptake of solar in our communities yeah okay thanks marcus this is time for sure sorry about that um this is an animation uh it's a kiwi accent just a heads up and she talks fairly fast but um i'll advance a question to explain something 
it's about two minutes. This time we're good because we've got it here. Uh, he says, hopefully, we've got it. Got so much. Right. Can you see that now? No. Oh, I didn't share. Not yet. No, there's not an animation there? Okay, no. share screen. There it is. Right. Okay, this time. Thank you. Okay, an animation? Yep. Yep. Thank you. It's real and are looking for ways to reduce their reliance on traditional power generation while saving money and saving the planet. Globally, the electricity sector is changing into a clean, local, digital system. Australia is a clear example. In 2008, there were 8,000 rooftop solar PV systems. Now there are 2.2 million. Yet many households and small businesses will miss out on the benefits of solar energy because they don't have a suitable roof or are put off by the expense of installation and ongoing maintenance. Energy Democracy has come up with a solution. We work with communities to establish regional cooperatives, the members of which own shares in a renewable energy park built in the region. Energy democracy cooperatives not only enable members to reduce their reliance on traditional power generation, but also to get cheaper power. Putting all the panels and battery storage in the one location utilizes economy of scale, so the entry cost is very competitive. It also allows energy democracy to make use of any excess power and sell it on the wholesale market at the best price on the cooperative's behalf. This really gives power to the people. So how does it work? Shares in the cooperatively owned renewable energy park are sold in parcels that generate about half the average household's annual electricity requirements. You may purchase as many parcels as you like as long as you meet the cooperative's recommendations for good energy saving practices and goals. Energy Democracy helps to meet these goals through conversations with members in real time to learn about better energy saving practices in ways that could maximise their savings. It's important to know that the cooperative is governed by the members for the members. The elected board's role is to hold Energy Democracy to account and ensure the cooperative is adhering to the values and principles of the local community. The board can also be guided by the members' wishes to invest some of the surplus in community initiatives that support renewable energy or energy efficiency. Energy democracy cooperatives are designed to be sustainable. If demand exceeds the size of the original park, then more renewable energy parks can be built. The land lease is for a minimum of 20 years, during which time equipment can be replaced using maintenance reserves, so members don't have to put their hands in their pockets after their initial investment. Because the panels are in this park instead of on your roof, you don't lose your investment if you shift within the local area. If you shift away from the community, you can offer your shares back to the cooperative or sell to someone else. Energy Democracy is establishing renewable energy cooperatives in Australia and New Zealand, so now is the time to register your interest and take the first step towards a better, cheaper tomorrow. If you'd like to find out more about an energy democracy cooperative in your neighbourhood, Register your interest at energydemocracy.com.au or energydemocracy.co.nz. There you go. Is that useful? Explain some more things or maybe had more questions? <laughs> Created questions. Um, can I just say something to that? Of yeah. I think what I'd find really useful is some of those maths of how much land, how much power, how many members, um, because I know energy and democracy, and I know it's worked very hard to get where it's got, but, you know, it could have a multiplying effect if, you know, the people in this um, webinar can help sort of find some other parcels of land, some other networks and communities. Um, so having a bit more of those maths things, the details um, could be quite useful as, you know, I would certainly advocate if there is land in my municipality that could be put to this use. Um, I know, it, I agree with um, Marcus, it's not as quick as 
you know, the bulk buy program, which is, you know, available in many, many places. Um, and I'm really disappointed, Doug, you didn't put the stat for Hoppers Crossing. 34% of the homes in Hoppers Crossing have solar. Something like that anyway. Yep. Well done. Well done to your patch. <laughs> Not my house, but yeah, my patch. <laughs> your patch, your neighbourhood, your tribe. Um, thanks for that comment. I'll take that on board, sure. Uh, so there's a couple of questions, more questions from Ollie there. Um, asking uh, if if we were to go about trying to convince a body corporate of a small apartment block to install a virtual net metering solar system, what would be a good explanation of how it works and the benefits for owners and tenants? Okay. Um, I might put that one to ask Mark. I mean, SolShare is a group, SolShare that he's mentioned, um, basically facilitate that. They've got the technology which is hardware and or software to, to do that sort of stuff, basically. Uh, Marcus? Yeah, uh, well, I mean, I, I think that body corporates traditionally are pretty um, uh, reticent about, uh, about allowing, allowing for these types of initiatives. They're pretty conservative. Um, you, don't, you, know, you, know, you need to get a, uh, an overwhelming majority amongst amongst landholders to, to, to go ahead with it. So it's, it does stifle that type of innovation. But yeah, I, if, if you, again, if you had a, a specific site in, in mind, we'd, you know, you would need to approach a company like Avida or, or the state government might, they might be able to broker something as well. I mean, I know that they're trying to, um, establish a number of pilot sites and it might be eligible to be funded that, you know, at least get some sort of um, seed, seeded funding from, from the state government at, to, to do a feasibility study at least and to, to canvas landholders and, and, and tenants to see whether there's that interest in, in going ahead. But it's the tech. What I'm trying to convey to you is that the technologies there now are pretty much off the shelf. So um, I think you just need to garner sufficient interest, and and that that would hopefully carry the day. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and and just if I could squeeze in a follow up question. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean, I have a specific um, place in mind. So I actually own. An investment property in Footscray um, on a small like 12 unit block um, and it's an idea that I sort of like just brought up um, just to test how to go a couple of years ago but I didn't know how a system like that would actually work and I know that it would take a bit of um, a bit of work to kind of educate and convince the, um, the owners corporation about how a system would work and what their investment might need to be and, um, and the potential benefits. So could you quickly give me a little bit of detail about how the system actually works? Well, on a technical level, it would, you'd have panels on, on the roof. So depending on, you know, the, how much roof space you've got, but you would, you'd put up the panels, you'd have the inverter probably um, normally that's the basement, so you'd run your solar power down wires from the roof down to the basement. You'd generate the electricity there, and then the smarts would would be they call um, that uh, this behind the metering technology. So um, the power would, would would land at the at the main switchboard at the at the premises, and then people would draw down on that, that solar power and the smart meters would then work out um, the power that's been used from the solar panels and presumably you would get a discount, a good discount from that and then and power that's just been ordinarily taken from the grid which would, um, wouldn't be given a discount. So it, it would work in that type of way I would envisage. I, as I said, I haven't been involved in anything at that level, 
but um, but yeah, I'd like to think that I could if 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 if, if, if the um, occasion um, presented itself. Yeah. Um, I, I just had a question for Doug regarding the role of energy democracy in in um, some of these co-op projects. Um, do, does energy democracy sort of take care of the the paperwork involved in planning approvals and that sort of stuff? And if so, is there a fee involved? You, you might you're on mute. You're, you're Doug. Thank you. What I said was, it's a great question, which I anticipated. Uh, just a quick bit of context so you know, I met Alan, who runs in the democracy, through Transition Towns. And um, when he told me what he's doing, I said, that's a great idea. I wish I'd thought of it. Okay, so that's just, uh, it's a great idea. Um, he's, he's spent, anyway, hours and hours and hours, years even, literally years, getting this worked out. Um, I'm not too sure how to say it, but I know it's the right thing. Like I put panels on my roof when Hobson's Bay had their bulk buy, which we mentioned, just mentioned 10 years ago. I just knew it was the right thing to do. And of course I don't regret that. It was the right thing to do as well as with the premium feeding tariff. I'm seeing this project almost an extension of that. It's the right thing to do and we should do it. Um, back to your question though. Yes, they're charging a fee, but because the board of the co-op um, hasn't got all, everything it needs, even though we're a great group of smart techie people, we haven't got the ins and outs of doing all that stuff, especially with dealing with fair trading and councils and permits and, and energy markets. Um, so yes, there is a fee, um, but it's pretty low and it's still, the budget has you know planned for all of that, basically. Um, yeah, it's just planned for that in the budget um and how else came to that yeah does that answer that yeah no that, that's good because uh i mean like i've i've spoken to other people um like the, the members of the bendigo sustainability group and that they've been very generous with you know offering sort of copies of their um legal contracts and things like that that they worked yeah. out um with supplying the city of greater bendigo um and you know, I, look, I don't have a legal background either and the, the groups of people um, that I'm involved with locally here, you know, there's a lot of enthusiasm and there's sort of varying degrees of knowledge about solar and about climate and all that sort of stuff. But I'd say generally the thing that um, we would lack would be that kind of um, specialist expertise in oh. what they've done and also just the capacity to do it because, you know, most people work. Um, they they do this stuff voluntarily and it it's almost like um a full-time job really to to do the setup properly i would think yeah yeah i mean it's taken alan years to get this stage and he's um yeah i've given him a plug haven't i but basically um he's really passionate and i give him full credit for that um if you know some people a small group can be a bigger group and if you know especially a bit of land by all means you know get in touch with me and or with alan directly um, happy to talk. Did you say Bendigo? Oh, uh, no, I've spoken to the Bendigo people. I'm in Kingston. Right, that's right. You said, yep. yep, okay. Yep. Um, we'd be happy to have something similar in Bendigo for sure. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, definitely. Like anywhere around Australia. Did I say we're doing one in New Zealand as well, Wellington? Um, that's going ahead slowly but surely. And Gawler, Gawler north of Adelaide, just a satellite city outside, about 100k, I think, north of Adelaide is another uh, project in the pipeline. Okay. So feel free to follow up. Uh, I'll put my number on the chat, actually. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Does anyone want to have any more questions? I um, am also interested in um, in batteries. Um, like I chatted a question in the chat. I'm not sure if it's uh, directly relevant, but in general, the price of batteries, because um, when I installed my solar system uh, a couple of months ago, I uh, was seriously, seriously 
wanted to get batteries, but ultimately it was the price that was um, too high a barrier. So uh, what, what do you guys think about um, how the price of batteries is going to move in the future? Oh, well, <laughs> I've been asked that question for the last five years and I've just been saying, well, if you hold off a couple of years, the prices are, are going to come down. We'll be, you know, we're, we're return on investment will, will um, you get your return on investment under five years. That seems to be the, um, the critical point for making these types of investments. Uh, my feeling is that uh, the batteries, it's, uh, my feeling is that I, I, I see that the price of electricity is going to continue to, despite having a minister for cheaper electricity, <laughs> Um, I think prices are going to go continue to, to go up, and um, and so it will. I think that it it will become e economic to think about putting batteries up for that reason, and for that reason, and and less so for the the cost of the batteries themselves, less less so as we go forward. But they, they will come down. I um, just thinking about how prices have plummeted. My father's panels that I helped put up almost 20 years ago, that he was paying four or five, five or six dollars a watt. Now, some of the panels I'm putting up now are less than 50 cents a watt. So it's a pretty, it's amazing just how, how that, that's become a lot more, um, um, you know, uh, economic. And I, I suspect, but I, I suspect that the battery prices won't won't they won't come down to to, to those levels. Uh, to, you know, won't fall down sixfold. Um, but yeah, they will obviously they will get cheaper. But um, but I think electricity will become more expensive. Uh, can I ask a question of you, Doug? Uh, just around in terms of uh, living in the Western suburbs, so we're in Brimbank, and there's uh, quite a lot of land potentially that uh, is not very good for other things because it's been used uh, for heavy industry or things along those lines. And I'm just wondering if there's guidelines uh, in terms of so solar farms about um, whether there are requirements around the land in terms of contamination, et cetera. So you're still on mute. Thank you. Okay, so, I mean, the one we had almost lined up in Altona North, like I said, that was, that was uh, industrial land or previously industrial land. So, like there are guidelines, obviously we work with the council and you know planning, regional planning authorities, etc. Um, case by case, I guess, but we it can be like the panels are on, up on stilts, so kind of what's on the ground is almost irrelevant. The Wellington one, mm, can I say that? The Wellington one is is on a previous tip site, um, so yeah. It can be almost anything, just like I said before, not good farming land, we want that for food. <laughs> not prime residential, because the price wouldn't be appropriate. Um, but quite seriously, if you know of someone with some land, you know, Brimbank or a bit further out uh, towards, yeah. Anywhere can be considered. If you know the, uh, the towers, high, high voltage towers that go across from, um, you can see them crossing the Western Highway, Anyway, if anything's on the table, that's what I'm saying, um, more or less. There's not guidelines, well, there are guidelines, but I don't know them, but it's based on the council. You know, the more I learn about this stuff, every, every square inch of land in the world has got some sort of planning thing ready for it. So there's always people trying to make the most out of something. And of course, it needs to be, being a cooperative and um, owner, owner base, we need to be uh, aware of all those things, but making sure it's the right thing for the community and for the land. In, in Horsham, for instance, we're working with the Aboriginal community as well, you know, keeping them uh, on board so we know that we're working with them and having 
native plantings in the area, or not in the area, but underneath the panels, potentially even a food source, you know, that are the right sort of um, food for that area that grow in that climate. Yep. Um, Doug, would it work on industrial rooftops? Industrial rooftops, well, yes, it does. It does, like Altona Gate Shopping Centre near me did that last year or two. I think all of Westfield Shopping Centres, I believe, that was a business decision for them and I'm pretty sure it was a good one. Um, so yes, short answer is yes. Yeah. Not necessarily our model, but the answer is yes. <laughs> it's, it's a large flat roof, so it's in a way, um, yeah, in a way it's a great way to make use of that roof space. Uh, he has talked, we, they have talked to some industrial rooftops, um, slightly different area, but similar, but different. But yeah, if you know of a big one that's possible, all means again, yeah. Yeah. I'm just typing something. Just on that with industrial rooftops, I mean, in the, in the West, like, you know, Tottenham and, and out that way, there's so many warehouses and distribution distribution centers with enormous roofs some of which have already got panels if you sort of take a browse on google maps with the satellite view on but yeah like there's there's huge just potential for unsolid roofs yep for sure yep and there and of course they're more central than you know, Ballarat is my example only, but they're more central. They're already in the suburbs or near the suburbs, nearer housing than what um, than what uh, some examples are. Yep. Is it like the Hepburn Wind Farm, for instance, had had a queue to people to join it. Once the people realised it was a good idea, you know, or could still have, for all I know, a waiting list of people wanting to join up. It's just such a popular and successful venture. There are companies out there that um, that uh, would install the solar panels, get it all connected, and then um, and then uh, they actually own the installation. They just rent the roof space, and then they pay you for that. Okay. So there, there, there are companies that that specialise in that type of business model as well. Mm. Yeah, similar but different. Sort of a slightly different way of doing almost the same thing. Sure. Sure. I think it's clear from, yeah, all the awesome questions we've had that there's lots of interest for personal and, you know, group related projects in the West. I'll say that loosely because I know we do have some people on who are, you know, broader than the Brimbank area. But um, at Brimbank Climate Action, we're a, a group, um, Hung, who's also online today, is a member of our little group. Um, we've been around for about a year and we um, worked um, on a community petition last year, which successfully got Brimbank um, Council to declare a climate emergency and worked with the council on their um, climate emergency plan, which um, just was resolved at the last council meeting in June. Um, it's got some commitments in there around working with community on solar um, projects or sort of community renewable energy projects. And um, our, now that we've sort of achieved that win with the um, declaration, we're looking at projects that we can be running locally to try and um, build the momentum and um, energy that, that local um, Brimbank residents have to also um, make changes individually and as a collective. And one of the projects that we are about to start um, singing loudly about is uh, something called Power Switch Brimbank. Um, so the idea is that we are encouraging people to uh, switch their energy provider to um, a community, uh, co a cooperative um, community energy plan that's offered through a new uh, energy company called Energy Locals. Uh, and uh, if you become a member of the cooperative, then any um, profits are shared within the collective. So they pr provide wholesale power rates and they um, invest back into the collective uh, and you are a member of the collective by paying a, a flat membership fee every month. 
So generally it works out at you because it's wholesale rates is cheaper than um, what most people are paying through your usual retail. Um, and it's a really great thing for people uh, who aren't able uh, perhaps to get solar panel on their roofs, but do want to be um, building the capacity for renewable energy uh, in the community. So that's something that we're going to be talking about more. And um, Hilma's put a link in the chat around that a little bit, um, a little bit back. Uh, but we're also really interested in um, other projects that would see real, you know, panels and things getting installed in our areas. And I think, um, Danielle, part of this project is around actually hosting an, a further follow-up discussion about ways in which we could actually form some projects locally that are around um, taking climate action. So I think, Ollie, you were asking a little bit about that before around, you know, actually building on the momentum that people have been talking about today and the cool ideas that are around. So um, I do encourage people to stay in touch with this project and, um, yeah, look out for those when they come up. Is that right, Danielle, to plug it? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, so essentially, we, um, I'll send out an email after this session and include details for, um, for Doug and for Marcus. But uh, we would like to keep in touch with you and let you know what uh, the other sessions potentially will be. So after the Share Economy next, next time, um, we're looking at holding some catch-up sessions just to go through the issues a little bit more deeply if people are really keen uh, to explore the, the, areas, um, the areas further. Um, but then we also have another four sessions which haven't... Um, we haven't decided topics, so we're really keen to ensure that the topics and, and projects that we're covering are what the community wants to hear about. Um, yeah, so if we, we will send an email out. If you're not interested in receiving emails, then just let us know and we'll take you off the email list, but we will, um, yeah, try and keep in touch with everyone. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I just wanted to say for, on behalf of Broomlake Climate Action, thanks to the Neighbourhood House for um, putting in for this grant and, and doing all the work, putting these sessions together and um, Doug and Marcus having your expertise along today. It's really yes. awesome to hear from you and hopefully we can stay connected and um, tap, tap into all that knowledge you have um, when we have some cool projects that we want to run here, right here in Broombank. Yes. Yeah. And can I just say thanks as well? Um, and, and for my part, I'm really keen to um, just find out more about the, the technical side of, um, you know, how various systems would work, the economics as well. Um, so like I can start spreading the word um, and, and seeing who else is interested. Um, yeah, so also in that email, Danielle, that you send out if there's any like resources like that any sort of explainers or videos or infographics or whatever um i'd be really keen on you know just something to educate myself a bit better no worries definitely is there any more questions or anyone else wants to say anything i want to say thanks to everyone for coming along it's been interesting i'm glad i've broken the ice for daniel's project um it's been great great discussion and questions and i appreciate your uh, input and um very worthwhile conversation and uh let's keep these balls rolling like we've said thank you uh, a big thank you to both you and and uh, doug and marcus um thanks for for facilitating or speaking at the session and and uh for um, putting up with my, this is the first one I've done, so there's been a few little teething issues here and there. Um, yeah, but thanks everyone for coming along as well, um, and we'll definitely be in touch and, 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 and find some resources to share. Um, thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Take care, stay safe. Cool. Thanks everyone. See you. Yes. Bye. Thanks everyone. Thanks Danielle. Thanks, Danielle. Awesome. That's great. Nice, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Julia. Bye. 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 I think if you, um, Doug, if you hit stop yep. recording. Okay, thanks. Good idea.